Hi, I'm Phil Craig. And I'm Andrew Loney. And together we aim to bring you the most scandalous stories and some of the most scandalous people in history. So thanks for joining us here on the Scandalmongers podcast. Now, Andrew, are you feeling anything in particular this morning? I am. I always feel it when we're together. And how would you describe that feeling? Well, scandalous. You shock me to the core. I'm feeling quite scandalous too, and I'm feeling quite excited about this episode, I have to be honest, because for me it's partly a story of journalistic success and failure. A sad failure from which my morale took years to recover, but I will get onto that one. It's a later. sort of failure in some ways. It's an honourable failure. Yes, well, it's a failure that led me to a deeper understanding of the subject matter, I think, of this particular programme, which is, I should say, for those who haven't read the description, Diana. Yes. Princess Diana. And one of your most successful books. Well, thank you. Still, um, I think, regarded as one of the, you know, the, the, the really important biographies of her. Well, maybe if it's not too much showing off, <clears throat> excuse me, from me, I should explain the background to this book. Yeah, I think it's because of the background that it, it is such a, a revolutionary book in some respects. Well, 20 years ago, before I was forced to sit in small rooms with you and talk to dwindlingly tiny audiences, I had quite a powerful job at a company, a production company called Brook Lapping, who made big political and historical documentary series. And... I think it's fair to say we, we probably had a global reputation for being one of the best at doing what we did. Won lots of awards, and we were, we were actually fated. We were chased by broadcasters from the BBC to PBS in America to make programmes. And our sort of secret source really was very careful, balanced, judicious reporting. So we would try and get to the heart of what was really going on in a subject. And we, I'm talking about really big stories like the hostage crisis in Beirut, or the, um, the falling apart of Yugoslavia, the Irish peace process, Watergate. Really big subjects. Um, I think it's also fair to say we were a bit kind of pleased with ourselves. We thought we were a little bit special. So. Well, I think respected, and you also had huge resources. Television has more than, I think, most, most writers. Well, that's, that's why this particular project was so interesting, because ITV came to us. This would have been about three years after Diane's death. And they said, we would love you to try and apply your method to the story of Diana, her marriage, and everything that's happened. And some of us were a little bit, ooh, dude, it's royal reporting. Oh, dear, that's for, that's for sort of hacks, isn't it? That's sort of Daily Mail type journalism. And actually, to be honest, in doing this, I came to respect the Daily Mail a good deal more than I did then because they did some amazing reporting on, the, on this subject. But, yeah, we were a little bit snobbish about it. But when, the more I got into it, the more thrilling it was really because I think for the first time and maybe the only time we were able to take as much time as we needed with a very big team I mean like 10 to 12 people and we got to meet everybody um they weren't all on the record and no journalist likes to rely on off the record sources but people were prepared to talk to us I don't think many of these people had ever spoken before or since no I think you had amazing sources and what struck me is having read lots of Diana books is it felt very fresh we, we feel it's a familiar story but actually there's a lot more that you told and I suspect is still to be told well I do too um yeah we got to the real insiders some of them had only meters out of London secretly in hotels um or friend houses of friends of friends it was all a little bit cloak and dagger and remember, this was only a couple of years after Diana's death, um, and feelings were still quite raw. And why do you think these people talked to you? I mean, they included people like James Hewitt and James Hewitt's mother. Well, I mean, James had spoken to quite a few people. I think his mother was a real coup, and she gave us an absolutely original insight into that key relationship in Diana's life. But what I'm most proud of is the insiders from the household who gave us just a ringside seat on the marriage, especially the early years of the marriage, um, and I think they kept trusted us because we had that reputation for making really balanced and fair programmes. And I think, to be fair, a lot of them felt that they had been part of a process that hadn't delivered the truth. And we'll get to this. Oh, really? What? So they'd been spinning against her and now felt guilt, guilty them, about it? Some of them, I think, did feel that. Others who'd, who had seen the true story unfold in front of them felt that all the public had been provided with up to that point was caricatures, you know, really exaggerated versions of what had happened. Yeah. Well, I mean, certainly what comes out of the book is it's a much more human story and much more understandable. And, you know, there are villains, but 
you know, in some ways, it's a rather sad story. It is a sad story. It's a very sad story. And I don't. I still believe, and I know uh, we're both friends with Patrick Jefferson, who was, as, if people who don't know, Diana's only private secretary through her and through the most successful time of her career, royal career. He also feels it didn't have to end the way it did at all. Um, well, and time and time again throughout the book, I'm sure we'll talk about it, things could have happened a slightly different way if she hadn't gone skiing with certain people just, or he hadn't gone skiing with people just before they got married. That's right. He might have been counselled not to marry her. Uh, and I think there are all these extraordinary sliding door bits of the story where it could have gone so it differently. Was a, it was an endlessly fascinating and surprising thing to do. Um, but actually, I mentioned earlier, there was a sort of slightly bitter taste, and that is, at the time... And I think this is a really important part of the dynamics of how the world came to learn about Diana and Charles. At the time, people could make an awful lot of money by getting a royal scoop, a book, a serial deal. I mean, we're talking rectory and Wiltshire money. And I quite fancied having a rectory in Wiltshire. It, it, still, well, it may still come. Well, Who well, knows? From this podcast, I think we'll have one each, won't we? Exactly. But we did a serial deal for the book before it had been written, based on the fact that we were bringing all this amazing journalistic integrity to bear. I shan't name the newspaper. When the book was finished and the series went out, I had this really difficult phone call where they explained, actually, the book wasn't scandalous enough. It wasn't full of the kind of rancorous new details they were hoping for. Because a lot of what went into the book was my analysis, or my team's analysis, of how various stories had been spun before. So it was like a... Often we were saying things that you believe are true are just exaggerated versions of a relationship falling apart, further spun by journalists and newspapers who and people who want a directory in Wiltshire. Exactly. Well, you demolish a lot of myths. I mean, I think one of the most interesting was the story of her throwing herself down the stairs. Yes, that was one of the famous stories. Most people believe it's true. I'm here to tell you it isn't. Um, and I'll explain why later. So, yes, yeah, so I lost my serial deal. Um, although, to be fair, I did get another one, but it was for a lot less money. Uh, but I learned a lesson, really, I learned that the media was sort of incentivized to treat this failing marriage as a fair game. And the more you look into it, actually the participants in the failing marriage, and I include Dinah in this too, fed that process for their own reasons. Well, it's sort of one of our themes, the fact that the past is curated, it's shaped not just by the people directing the story, but by the people reporting it. Uh, and in a sense, what we're trying to do as historians is to try and t pick apart the myths to tell what really happened, either what was covered up or, or what was, was, was spun, right. which wasn't right. That's right. Then there's such a lot of that in this, Andrew. You know, you and I, we've both seen marriages of friends fall apart, relationships breaking up, and you've probably, I have, sat with people going on and on about all, how awful this person was and how the terrible things that they'd done, and, and then you go back with your partner after the dinner party or whatever, and you say, do you know, we were on that holiday with them and it wasn't like that at all. And we went to that dinner party and they didn't have a row like that, did they? And you realise that the dynamics of a divorce amongst ordinary people make you exaggerate. Yeah. Make well, you exaggerate the, and highlight the worst things that the other person has done. Um, and this was just that, but it was played out on a massive public stage where huge amounts of money could be made by getting one part of that story and then further twisting it. And I actually do believe, I think this is true of Diana especially, that by the end, she was defending a version of her own life that she'd that was come to a believe. little bit twisted by some of her allies. And that does sound odd. And it does sound odd for a biographer to actually say the subject of his biography um, was was sometimes wrong about herself, but I think she was in the latter years. Well, that was her truth, but she'd sort of forgotten about her childhood, hadn't she? And she'd created this new this new picture which people had bought into, which wasn't actually what really happened. Well, let's let's start at the beginning, if, yeah. you, if you'll yeah, indulge yeah, yeah. me. Because I, yeah, I, I think the childhood's very interesting. Of course, it's so important when you tell about, write a biography. And I, I should say that uh, I, mean, I, I probably went into this trying to be neutral. Um, I came out of the experience much more favourably disposed to Diana than I'd expected to be and quite a bit more hostile to the um, the people ranged against her, which obviously included her husband, but not just him by any means. Um, that said, she was quite capable of spinning her own life in ways that we found hard to prove. Her child is a good example. Most people who've read Morton's book, and Morton, Andrew Morton, great biographer, your friend, I think. Yeah, yeah I think he's a very good biographer, very underrated. Um, you know, his book is the 
the, the commonly accepted version of Diana's life from her point of view. And she talks about this unhappy, lonely childhood, divorce of her parents. Um, we found very little evidence this. We did an awful lot of work on the childhood. I know you can never know someone's own heart and see the world through their eyes, but we met so many of her friends, her teachers, people she shared holidays with and flats with and relationships with. And I mean, yes, her parents got divorced, kind of like a lot of people's parents got divorced, get divorced. She saw a lot of them. She had a warm and happy relationship with, with, with both her mother and her father and, her, and with her siblings. Um, she was comfortably off. She was she did well at school. She was never academically brilliant, but she was gifted in lots of other ways. She was popular. And one of the most amazing witnesses to this, Diana, in the months and years before she meets Charles, is a woman called Mary Robinson, a very tough American businesswoman in London. Yes, that's... Looking for a nanny. Never spoken before. I don't think she had, but... And she was very upset reading some of the things that had been said about Diana. As I say, some of these were things that Diana herself had said. I said, I would never have trusted a troubled, unhappy young woman like the one I'm reading about to look after my kids. I'm in a new city. I've got plenty of money. I have my pick of the nannies. Um, this, this person was fantastically competent and reliable and cheerful. And I could absolutely see why a series of young men would try to court her leading up to the Prince of Wales. Well, also you talk about, uh, you know, she wasn't academic. I think she failed all, all her O levels. But at the same time... You know, she did seem to have this common touch, this ability to engage oh, she with people. always had that from a and very that young age. Across, that comes across very much. Some very yeah. touching stories of her um, as, a, a, as a teenager uh, being drawn to helping people in homes, for example. Mm. And an absolutely lovely story from the very early years of the marriage, which always really made me, made me stop and think. It showed mm -hmm. just how very different she was from the people she was marrying into. Um, it's in, I think it's in Wales in 83. She goes into a home and there's an old blind man and he looks sad, and she says, what's the matter? And he says, everybody tells me how beautiful you are, and, I, and I, I really wish I could see you. And without missing a beat, she takes his hands and places them on her face, mm. which is just the most astonishingly intimate thing to do with a complete stranger. And yet, that sort of level of empathy um, is probably why someone like Mary Robinson trusted her to look after her kids. Yeah, you know, yeah. she, and she had that throughout her life. The other thing that people often talk about, think they know about Diana before she marries Charles, is that, oh, she's very innocent. She's the sort of sacrificial virgin. Well, I mean, I don't know what to say. I, I have no particular reason to, no details of her sex life, but I know that her social and her romantic life was very full. She dated bankers, stockbrokers, soldiers. She went to parties and balls and skiing trips. It wasn't a closeted life. Plus, she was a member of one of the most powerful and well-connected families in the country. She and, knew a lot uh, about the world she was marrying into. And her sister had married into the royal families, or, or, or sorry, in, in effect, because yeah, uh, royal fellows worked for, for, for the royal right. family. That's right, and another of her sisters had dated Prince of Wales, but dated yeah. Charles. Yeah. So she wasn't a naive ingenue at all. And also, in some ways, she had pitched her cap at him. I mean, she had had his picture on her walls. She'd always said that she would marry him. She was in love with him, and in some ways, he was the one who couldn't quite decide himself. That's absolutely right. I think she was... Um, she. Um, I think her expectations were disappointed very quickly in the marriage. But I also think she went into it knowing that it wouldn't be quite the fairy tale because she was aware of Charles and Charles's circle and the sort of man he was, which we'll come to in a second. But I do, I do wonder why later in her life she actually exaggerated the sort of pain of her own childhood and adolescence. And all I can think of is that she was perhaps by then playing for sympathy Therapy. I think therapy that, is something yeah. that drives you mad. I think she was under the influence of a lot of therapists, and you, and often they try to locate present pain in past experiences. And I think Diana kind of fell for that because some of these therapists were on the kind of weirder end of the scale as well. So she wasn't really supported when she went in. I mean, people talk rather cynically. It was an arranged marriage, and 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 she was expected basically to to fall in. And there really wasn't. Uh, I mean. Again, it's debatable about how much support she had and encouragement and, 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 you know, he was, as you say, just carried on his bachelor life, really. Well, I think that's moving to Charles now. You know, he, he had a very, we, we think of him now as rather a stuffy man. But, of course, in the late 70s, he was seen as a playboy, and he was a playboy. He loved to travel the world. He could meet anybody he wanted, famous artists and writers and musicians, a string of glamorous girlfriends, 
and he was having at least one, probably two affairs, with the wives of his friends. And this is the life that perhaps as a prince he thought he was entitled to. Certainly, um, the private eye used to publish these funny stories about friends of the Prince of Wales laying down their wives for their prince. It would arrange to be out when he came to visit. And we'd, obviously, Camilla is the most famous one, but many people think that Lady uh, Kanga Tryon was perhaps the, the bigger love of his life, uh, bigger love when Diana first entered his life. And then she's sort of been written out of the script, really, she because has, she's she's dead. She died tragically. Um, and But I think Charles's lifestyle is, is, is part of the reason why the marriage was slightly kind of I want to say doomed, but it set off under a bit of a black cloud because I don't think he ever really wanted to change it. And Diana did. She, she, she knew about Camilla. She, she met Camilla. She was perfectly aware that that relationship had happened. He told her that he would stop it. Then famously, she finds the bracelet. Just before the marriage, he's, he's, he's going to give this bracelet to Camilla to thank her for her support over the years. But, and Diana says, please don't, and he does. Exactly, and she's at the wedding, though she gets disinvited from the wedding breakfast. That's right. But, I mean, in some ways he can't cut loose from her. Uh, and, again, the big debate is how quickly he re-establishes contact with her. Well, one of the courtiers, and, you know, unfortunately I can't name these people because that was the terms under which we met them, but I wrote this down. He, he was a bachelor. He loved the single life. He loved to travel the world and he was bounced into a marriage and that's the hard truth of it. He didn't want to change his lifestyle or, frankly, his relationships. That's what this person said. Um, and I think that's true. And I, I also think Diana sort of, I said she wasn't an ingenue, but she did think that he would move on from that life and create a new life with her. And the early years of their time together, they're, they're quite weird. You know, she's often alone. She'd come back from some event, maybe having had a great success, to have dinner by herself on a tray. But she didn't know where her husband was. She would ask people where he was and they wouldn't tell her or they would make up a story. Now, whether he was with Camilla or somebody else or not, she was naturally suspicious. And It's like a psychological thriller, isn't it? Well, we use the word... You can see why she might become a bit paranoid later. Well, in the 2022, we use the word gaslighting a lot. I don't think that word was used very much in the early 80s. But actually, I think in terms of Diana's story, it's really quite appropriate. She lived in a slightly twisted psychological environment where she wasn't told the truth. Um, she was, you know, stepping up. She was still very young into this big role with very little support. And she didn't know who she could trust. I mean, she this suggestion that even her valet was feeding stories to the press. I think the role of the press is almost universally negative. <laughs> and I would include quite a lot of the biographers in this too. I'm not blaming them. I mean, you know, you report amazing stories and scandals because... They're people incredibly are interesting, yeah, and these are important people. Um, but I do believe um, in the early years of the marriage, she was treated particularly badly. But I believe something else as well, which is what, another reason why my book was perhaps too nuanced to, to please the serialization editor of this newspaper. I think over time she did come to accept a sort of arrangement, an arrangement that is not that uncommon amongst people of that class at that time. In fact, an arrangement that some people think the Queen herself may have made. Um, I think she was never totally at peace with that. There were moments where if Charles flaunted another woman, and he often did with Camilla at parties, there's a famous scene in The Crown where he's telling dirty jokes with Camilla in front of all the lo lots of sort of laughing friends. And I think that that is pretty well sourced, that that sort of thing happened. So she would occasionally be angry if he flaunted it too much. But there were times, and I think, maybe three or four years and the most successful years where she basically said, okay, I'll have my own life. You know, we have the children now, we have our joint roles and I'll pursue any romantic interests I have separately. And you can see if she's feeling unloved and unwanted and someone like James Hewitt pops up, who's her writing instructor, and you can see, and I think one of the things that struck me about your book is, is these rather cosy domestic scenes. Here she is given the sort of rather ordinary life that she, she seems to want to to aspire to. It's really touching. And I think meeting Shirley Hewitt, James's mother, was so, it was such a, it's one of those things you remember in your career. Like I said, many of these meetings are in sort of obscure country house hotels. We spent the weekend with James and Shirley um, at this beautiful hotel in Devon. My wife, Frances, came along and we ended up playing um, Trivial Pursuits late into the night with the Hewitts. And at one point, Frances says, James, you're cheating. <laughs> 
And he sort of leant forward and leered at her and said, of course I am. I'm a cad, don't you know? <laughs> and, you know, you, did, you could spend, you didn't need to spend much time with Hewitt to realize why Diana would choose to be in his company than her husband because you know, it wasn't just the, the fact that he was interested in other women. He, he, he professionally was rather jealous of her. He didn't like the way that she did the job. He was very serious-minded about his role. and He wanted to be with Lawrence van der Post and talk about community architecture. Well, I mean, in some ways, the age like gap was one of the problems and the educational you know, gap was a big problem. And you can see James Hewitt is just a very sort of normal guy. Uh, and attentive and, yeah, and charming funny. and good looking. And he actually fancied her and wanted to yeah. be with her. And I think she really quite liked that. Yeah. Isn't it ironic, you know, she could have had anyone in the world and Charles doesn't realize it? Well, that's right. Um, but I think he resented it from the word go that he was sort of, in a sense, forced to marry. Um, and then he resented that she didn't always accede to the terms of the deal that he thought they had. And then he resented the fact that she was rather better at the job than him. And I do, a lot of people have said that to us on the inside. There's a great, great episode of The Crown as well. I know The Crown gets a lot of stick, um, and it does exaggerate terribly. But that episode in Australia, I know some of the people who were briefing for that episode, and they were there. And it's, it, it captures the very, very honest moment in the relationship where Diana is so good at the job, and Charles is, you know, life is messy and complicated, and he wanted to support her some days. But other days he was just really angry that she got all the attention. Because let's face it, he spent his whole life preparing for this gig. But isn't the irony that the, the royal family are trained for this job and actually the ones who are often best at it are the ones who are outsiders, the Camillas, the Cates, the Sophie Wessex. That's right. And Diana. Um, and they do it effortlessly. Yeah. and it, Instinctively. Yeah. And so they, not a good argument for the monarchy, is it? Well, he just overthought everything. As, as I say, though, I think there was a time when she had Hewitt, he had Camilla, they shared Highgrove... Everybody knew what was going on because the Princess of Wales can't travel alone. So she would go down to spend weekends with Shirley and James. She'd even go down there when James was away just to be with Shirley. It was like a sort of... She was like a mum to her, A really. mother-in-law figure. Mm, mm. And they would sit and they would drink tea and look out on the countryside and play, play to Scrabble. But, of course, she travelled with her police protection officers. They needed to know where she was. And you have that great story of one of them actually cooking supper one night and, and he, uh, singing. He had a good voice as well. And it's those touches, it I think, that really bring it alive. It's a really touching story. And, you know, there was a certain stability, I think, in Diana's life. And this is the period, I guess we're talking the mid-80s now, where she was getting more and more successful. Patrick Jefferson is their private secretary. She's really developing her own role as a kind of global philanthropist and campaigner. Um, and she's very much of the time. You know, we think of the 80s, we think of her bopping around at Live Aid, we think of her dancing uh, on stage that time, and, you know, she seemed to be more of the moment than, than Charles. Yeah, was yeah. Looking she more, was the young breath of fresh air, Charles really. was talking to plants and thinking of Lawrence van der Post. Well, I suppose like. the two, you know, we have to have both, but I think also the extraordinary thing is that all changes, and it changes because of basically a, an intercepted phone call, doesn't it? Well, that's right. Um, so my assessment of everything was... It wasn't a totally happy arrangement. There were the, there were the occasional angry moments, but they they were sort of making it work. And then, mobile phones, and scanners, and people start picking up conversations, some of which are very embarrassing. And I think what many listeners to this podcast won't know is that the famous Squidgy Gate tape sits in the safe for nearly I think two years before it's broadcast. But, and this is the key part, Diana knows it's there. Why, into, why isn't it released? Is it people worried that, or are they just saving it for the right moment? That's a really good question. We interviewed the editor of The Sun at the time, Stuart Higgins. Basically, The Sun is approached, someone's approached by this guy, played this tape. It's clearly an intimate conversation between um, Diana and a man called James Gilby. So Hewitt has moved on, or, I've, or is he posted abroad? I can't quite remember. But He's in the Gulf, I think, isn't he? She's having this relationship, quite a brief relationship with James Gilby, um, who she'd actually dated before, or when she was a teenager, before Charles. And the conversation isn't actually that embarrassing, but it's clear, it's clear that they're having a relationship. He uses this word squidgy. She talks about the royal family not appreciating her and what she does for them. So they go to see... The sun hacks, turn up, and this is a call you never want. Knock on the door. It's the sun. Excuse me, Mr. Kilby, we have a tape recording. 
uh, in which you seem to be on an intimate terms with the Princess of Wales. Would you like to talk to us? Goes white as a sheet. Slams the door. Instantly he's on the phone to Diana. So what does Diana know? She knows they have it. She doesn't know what's on it. It could have been much worse. It could, could have been, been anything. Because, I mean, there could be lots and lots of conversations. I'm sure there were. So why has only one of these emerged? It's just chance. It was just chance. I think the security on those mobiles in the early years was lamentable. I remember as a local journalist at Granada, we were always telling stories about people picking up, like, conversations between ambulance crews and things like that. It was quite easy to just listen in to the world on these scanners. But... Suddenly, Diana has a huge problem. At any moment, that tape could be broadcast. And that would blow up her marriage and put her in a very bad position for any divorce because she would seem to be the guilty party. She doesn't know at this point that there's another tape out there in which Charles is talking to Camilla in a much slightly, much more embarrassing and a sort of more frank, sexually frank way. But she doesn't know that. What she does know is this tape could emerge any time. So within weeks, she's arranging to get her side of the story out. And this is where this arrangement I speak about truly unravels. Because she talks to Andrew Morton through her friend James Colthurst. And as we know, she makes these recordings for Morton. And this is a... I mean, can you think of any equivalent moment to this in the story of the British royal family? I mean, it's amazing. Well, I mean, it's extraordinary. You know, historians are fighting to get access to, to historical documents, sometimes going about hundreds of years and being prevented from doing so. And in fact, there's an exemption under the Freedom of Information Act, which prevents communications with, with the sovereign. And here we, we're getting the members of the royal family communicating with the press themselves uh, about most intimate and, and, and contemporary moments. I mean, it shows what hypocrites they are, really. <laughs> well, I guess it does. Um, yes, indeed, it does, especially in thinking of your experience as getting access to, to official papers and private papers that are owned by the state. But the idea that the Princess of Wales was willing to give a very one-sided account of her marriage to a journalist, knowing it would become, you know, all over the newspapers... Um, she must have been desperate. She's on self-destruct. I mean, but she had all these people, like Patrick Jefferson, advising her, and she clearly wasn't trusting anyone, <sighs> even though those who seemed to be working in her best interests. I think we have to remember from her point of view, she felt she was up against what she used to call the nasty boys. There's a great quote from Hewitt in the book and in the series when he says, you have to remember, this was a woman who was gentle and kind, but she was hardened. And that's what happened when you go up against the nasty boys. Um, by what by this she means the friends of her husband who were already briefing against her. It was low level. Um, like I say, there was a, I think there was still a sort of arrangement between them. But she must have known what was coming so the minute this tape became public, and it could have been at any moment. She didn't know. Um, so it's a preemptive move, but it escalates the whole thing. Well, it does escalate it because, and you ask a good question: why the son didn't publish that tape? And we asked the same question to Higgins, and he said. They didn't want to be responsible for breaking up the marriage. They were actually trying to be a public spirited. I mean, many, the people, sun. <laughs> many people will raise their eyebrows. Um, but that's what Gosh, they said. They I wonder how often they've done that on other occasions. They didn't feel the time was right. I mean, obviously, they did publish it later once Morton comes out. Um, so the irony is, in some ways, this would have all been quiet uh, if she had not gone to Morton. Well, that tape, Maybe there would have been some trigger later on. She d she doesn't know what's in the son's safe and she doesn't know what the son's going to do and she can't ask them, so she doesn't ask them. So I think she's getting a retaliation in first and what retaliation it was. You know, she blows open the whole story of Charles's affair. She talks about her own sadness, her own bulimia. She talks about suicide attempts. And again here, this is a biographer slightly turning against this subject because I'm very sympathetic to Diana. I think she was famously, somebody said, I think it was Patrick Jefferson, she was more spinned against than spinning and more sinned against than sinning. But I think in this Morton book, she does go too far. You know, well, she, she, she exaggerates things that... Um, and she lies about them. He's forced to publish the tapes later to, 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 because she denies some of the things. But she, also, well, she, she, she denies that she said some of these things, like falling down the stairs is a good example. You mentioned it earlier in the podcast. We really dug down into that story, uh, right down to the people that originally reported it and their sources inside the household. There was an argument early in the marriage. She's, she's pregnant with William. 
She slips a couple of steps, grabs a handrail. Charles is concerned. They call a doctor. She's fine. So she never actually even falls on the floor? I genuinely think that's what happened. And I think the people who reported it would have reported the full story. If anything, they would have exaggerated it. Mm. And I certainly think the Sun journalists would have reported the full story if, if that's what had happened. But it, it was quite a minor thing. But it, in, by the time she's briefing Morton, six, seven years later, it's the grand kind of uh, massive Hollywood moment of her going all the way down the steps, landing at the feet of the Queen. Oh, yes, yeah. And everybody, and Charles doesn't care. He rushes out to... to you know, to He's play see, polo or something. Or see Camilla. Maybe. Oh, no, the whole thing is so exaggerated. And I actually believe the original version that was briefed to the original journalists. So why, sh- why is Diana making everything look worse than it was? Well, it's partly that's what happens in divorces. But I think it's partly that she knows or now she's in a desperate battle for public sympathy. And she is. And then he begins, or his friends begin, to, to, to try and shape the narrative and so Gosh. the thing gets worse and worse, doesn't it? This is the hardest part of all of it. And I think actually, in terms of scandals for the future, <laughs> not just for our podcast, there's maybe more to be found out about this period because the next period, I think, is really quite dark. Charles is really under a lot of pressure. The Morton book puts him in a terrible light. And then, of course, the, his own tape comes out. This is the Camilla tape. Camilla tape. Um and there's genuine concern that he may not be up for being king, that the scandal is so overwhelming that people won't accept him. And that's when people start talking about skipping a generation to, to William, of course, is still quite young. He has to fight back. Maybe he doesn't have to, but he decides to fight back. And the period of the, the next couple of years, we're talking, what, 94, 5, 6... There's an awful lot of briefing about Diana, which is as twisted and as exaggerated as her briefing to Morton. Yeah. And some of it's very nasty, and I'm not sure the whole story of that time has been fully told. Jonathan Dimbleby is a key role, has a key role in this. Um, I mean, Jonathan is a very high-minded uh, writer and reporter, um, and he wants to, he's invited, or by a period of negotiation anyway, he, he's going to write the big authorised book about Charles. He wants to write about the constitution and community architecture and all that stuff. Of course, all anybody wants to read is the marriage. And he is given access to the friends. Now, for years, Charles had said, oh, you know, Charles, people speaking for Charles had said he doesn't want anything bad to be said about Diana. But that's now changing. And some very damaging things are being said about her. How much, as I say? Particularly about her mental health. About her mental health early in the marriage. And I think you have to be quite cynical about this. You know, what do men say when they're caught cheating? My wife doesn't understand me. She's crazy. I've tried to reason with her. She's impossible. And so this is like a bigger version of that. But also, she's, she's not behaving well herself. I mean, she's making all these nuisance calls to one of her lovers, Oliver Hall. I don't think that's happened yet, oh, actually. Okay. But I agree. But later in her life, she certainly is responsible for that sort of thing. But we're talking now really about a very partial account of why the marriage failed from Charles's friends. Dimbleby had extensive correspondence with him. He doesn't publish a lot of the really damaging material. He decides not to. Yeah. Well, they're trying to use him as a conduit for this. But he does help Penny Juna, who was another writer, in her work, and she's another person who... I guess you'd have to say she was in the pro-Charles camp. She's if, sympathetic, if, yeah. If Morton is for Dimble, if Morton's for Diana, Juna and Dimbleby are for Charles. And she is, she's not quite so discriminating as does Dimbleby. And she does print some, some of the really um, sharp things about that, including a sort of diagnosis of her mental state, which is supposedly something that was being discussed called borderline personality disorder. Now, we talked to lots of specialists in this area, including psychiatrists who'd actually met Diana. And they said... It was impossible for her to have this, given the public success and her obvious poise and charm and hard work that she was able to do right through her life. Nevertheless, it becomes part of the Diana story that she has this problem. And some of those, I think, those briefings at that time are the reason that people believed that. Um, and I personally f- find that 
maybe one of the nastiest parts of the whole story. But it's stuck, isn't it? I mean, uh, you know, and one of the fascinating things is how polarised biographers have been. You know, you were penalised for trying to be nuanced and balanced. Uh, uh, you're not rewarded for, for, for trying to, to tell the truth. But there do seem to be very distinct camps. I think you had to not be just, one. Mm. Patrick Jefferson tells this amazing story where he knows that Dimbleby is being briefed by Charles's friends. And so he invites Dimbleby to meet Diana. And they have this lunch in Kensington Palace. And Diana is absolutely at her best. She's charming, she's funny, she's slightly flirtatious. She's absolutely on top of her brief. She's speaking very eloquently about politics and the world and world leaders. And Dimbleby, after the lunch, sits with Patrick and Patrick says, well, what do you think? Now, according to Patrick, Dimbleby says, if I can't believe what I've been told about Diana, I can't believe any of it. Now, I asked Dimbleby and he wouldn't comment. He wouldn't confirm or deny. He said that the lunch was private and that he says Patrick is wrong to share details of it. But that is what happened. Um, and I wonder if maybe it was meeting down and made Jonathan pull back a little bit from his initial plans, which I think I believe he had, to get into the mental health stuff. And maybe that was left for Penny Juna to do. But yes, there were, there were two camps now. And the stories are only getting more and more exaggerated and more and more hurtful. I mean, it must be particularly horrible for the children to read this stuff because they're now of an age where they are reading it. Um, but I would say one final thing about Dana's mental health. Right till the very end of her life, even when she starts to behave in some very unusual ways, the nuisance calls to Oliver Hall, for example, you did mention that. She does things like her trip to um, the landmine crusade trip where everybody she meets, and I interviewed lots of people who were with her on that trip, including the wonderful Christina Lamb, who was a tough war reporter, and there was no way she a royalist, and she went there thinking, oh, gosh, you know, I'm going to, you know, I'm not going to be given any old flimflam by um, somebody who was just going on a trip to get some publicity because her marriage has gone wrong. And she was bowled over by Diana, absolutely bowled over by how hard she worked, how how well how good she was with, with people, how, how across the subject she was. So I think if somebody had borderline personality disorder, which is a serious psychological illness, she couldn't have done that trip under that pressure. Well, also that collaboration with Jim will be backfires, doesn't it? Because he admits Prince Charles then to, to adultery with Camilla. And that again changes the narrative in some ways that people's sympathies. It's like a tennis match. It is like a tennis match. It just, the ball gets passed back and you have a completely different view again. But everybody, yes, everybody picks sides. Um, a few years later, after I'd done this book and my series, I did a, series, a separate series for Channel 4 with Patrick Jefferson presenting it. And he tells the most wonderful stories of what Diana was actually like to work for. And one I've always loved is the Carlisle Hotel was her favourite hotel in New York. And he recalls them checking in with her team, about four or five people. They go to her suite. And she rang down and said, It's Diana. I'd like to send me a bottle of cold Paul Roger and four glasses. I'd like to send me another bottle of Paul Roger every half hour until I tell you to stop. Golly. <laughs> <laughs> what a lovely boss. What a, lovely what a way boss. to live. <laughs> what a lovely boss. But also, is, is that a mentally ill person? Yeah. It isn't, is it? Yeah, yeah. It's somebody who's gone through a divorce, um, but always managed to hold it together, held lots of things together. Perhaps, you know, people have told me stories about Charles losing his temper. Shouting, raving, sort of foam-flecked rants over trivial things. Um, I think if if any, you know, neither of them were perhaps angels in that relationship. Certainly not in the way it broke up. But if if anybody's got a mental illness, well, I don't think it's Diana. And I wouldn't say it was an illness with Charles, but certainly temper has has always been his one of his weaknesses. And even in recent weeks, I think we've seen examples of that with a pen. Didn't we? Yeah, exactly. The Couldn't cope with a pen. The petulance comes out. Never mind. And well, we're coming to the end of the podcast, so oh. we should, I don't know, try and wrap up a little bit. I'm just fascinated by, clearly, the Oliver Hall thing leads to her wanting less security, which leads to her death. Uh, and then it would be fascinating to see how you, if you feel you, your, your views have changed. You know, we've now, uh, it's what, 25 years since she died. Would you re really? redo it's... your book in a different way? Do you think that there's now a well, consensus I, about them? I think, them, actually, there's probably the more to on. come out about the propriety of some of the things that were said about her in those desperate days of briefing when I think Charles felt he might lose his inheritance. 
um, he's now the head of the Church of England. He's the head of state. Did he always behave? Did he allow people around him to behave in ways that justify that role? I think that question has still not properly been answered. I think there's more to be found about that period. Um, and perhaps it will come out. We'll be doing more podcasts. Exactly. About I think we both have a feeling it might. But I think there's a very British tradition of, you know, we talk about books, serial deals, and, you know, not, uh, not going, you know, people going into the world of caricature. I think the Diana Charles story, it's a bit 18th century, isn't it? I mean, people quite liked the age of Gilray to, to laugh at the, the antics of those who ruled them. Um, so bracingly democratic, if a little bit rude. But it's, I mean, it's an interesting point to look at the story again. I mean, people are still fascinated by Diana. Books are still being published. The bodyguard, one of the bodyguards that pair has just done a book. Uh, and but as you, you say, the stories are still, still are coming out. But also I think, I mentioned the word gaslighting earlier. I should also mention, I think, Me Too. 25 years on, we, we look at sexual politics in a very different way to the way it was looked at in the mid to late 90s. And I wonder if, and I think Diana might have received a, bit, a lot more sympathy for the situation she was in, especially in those weird early years of the marriage, which would induce paranoia in anybody. But also, you know, we haven't talked about the famous Panorama interview, but of course that would have again have changed sympathies, the way that she was lied to. Well, I want to do a whole podcast just on that, because right. lots of my friends were involved in that. Yeah. No, I um, think it's a really important story, and, and, and it's finally come out, but it's taken time. Poor, poor Diana doesn't really know... You know, never lived to see it. Well, that's a, okay, we've talked a lot in our brief history of this podcast about tipping points. Jimmy Savile, lots of rumours. Suddenly there's a tipping point where it's accepted. We talked about Mount Batten, lots of rumours. Maybe a tipping point is approaching on that subject, maybe not. Martin Bashir, in my industry, you would have heard it too. Lots and lots of rumours about what really went on to make that sausage. Nobody wanted to know the ingredients, so now eventually it comes out. I think maybe Charles might face, face his own one day. I do believe that. I think it's possible he might. Yes, no, I agree with you. I think that's absolutely right. Another, is there anything else you'd like to talk about in the way uh, uh, her legacy? I mean, looking back, you know, that question about whether you would change anything, I mean, in the book. I mean, clearly, if new stuff comes out about that period, that will be incorporated into a new edition. But uh, do you think that, that you got it basically right or the bits that now you look back and say, actually, we didn't on her? It's a good question. Right? Um, I was possibly too nice to... All my friends said, oh, you're going to fall in love with Diana. Everybody does, my female friends. Well, those sort of more cynical ones in, in, in television, including members of the team actually who made the show, said, oh, Phil, you know, you're going to fall for that, aren't you? Because men do. But actually... I don't think we appreciate enough how good she was at the job. We've seen how bad royal people can be in recent years. But I think she absolutely transformed what was possible in being a royal. And she, well, she helped define an age. Exactly, and she modernised it. She modernised it, but she was also able to use her skill set to go into places that royals just didn't go. I can my idea, if, if Charles had married Camilla in 1979, would either of them have gone to an AIDS clinic or a homeless shelter? or got involved with landmines? It's a ridiculous question. They were from a different age. They have their own stand qualities, their own strengths, no doubt. Stability, tradition, all that's important. I see that. But Diana offered something magic. Well, and I have make... to say, and Megan as well, is there another, is there a slight parallel here that somebody brings a little bit of magic from outside and the institution goes, oh, my God, we can't well, have that. I don't know. I think Kate, Kate has done that, you Absolutely. know. I think she engages. I mean, you have the, you know, a very interesting piece on the walkabouts. You know, the Queen goes and takes a few flowers and says, have you come far? And Diana would engage with her. And I think Kate certainly does that. I, I think we can perhaps get on to Megan. Maybe that's another podcast. Well, I hope it is. Um, I, I think Megan is a completely different sort of personality. It's all about Megan rather than about the job. But um, what was the relationship like with the Queen? Because in some ways they were representative of two very different eras and approaches. I think that's one of the great untold stories of the whole Diana affair. Everybody in the institution tries to protect the Queen, or tried to protect the Queen. Of course, she is, after all, the focus of what it's all about. Patrick Jefferson always believed that the Queen's household were more sympathetic to Diana than they were to Charles, because they knew that Charles's household, Charles and his friends, 
were trying to, what's the word, you know, shore up his position at her expense. Um, that's what Patrick has written about, and he believes. Well, there were these two warring households, not just between Diana and Charles, but between Charles and Buckingham Palace. Well, maybe lying behind that, though, is the feeling that actually what the Queen would have really preferred is for an arrangement to continue. And I do think there was an arrangement, and I think it could have continued. I don't think the end was was, was inevitable at all. They could have stayed together, didn't have to be happily married. They didn't even have to live in the same house. She could have been queen, he could have been king. And could it have worked with all these tapes beginning to emerge? I think it and, could. And, and you talk a bit about the press and Rupert Murdoch being a Republican. I mean, with all that pressure, if they had behaved in a sense uh, with a little more uh, discreetness, they could have survived. I they were, they in could. some ways, they, they, they produced their own... Uh, they were the ones who actually produced the problems themselves. I mean, people love a twist in the narrative. Even after all the tapes, and even after the warring biographies, I think they could have survived. It was Obviously, the decision to do Martin Bashir was the final straw that led for the, to the divorce. But I don't think that divorce was necessary. I don't think that interview was necessary either. Um, they could have made it work. And it led to the end of Patrick Jefferson. It did. Who was in some ways the person who had really kept her on the straight and yeah, narrow. Yeah, we're going to have him on as a guest. Yes, he's such an interesting person, such good, very rare to have someone at that level with that sort of perspective. No, we must have him on, have, have him on one of our upcoming shows, and I think we've probably exhausted our audience's we have. interest in we, at least over an hour, I think. We could we could go on and on. I'm sure there are many more programmes. We haven't even got to the whole scandals surrounding her death and no, the question of whether... You know, it was a tragic accident with a drunk driver or some of the other theories that have been put forward. Um, I mean, that's a whole programme in itself. Spoiler alert, it was a tragic accident with a drunk (laughs) driver, is my view. But it's always worth exploring these stories. It certainly is. And thank you for helping me explore this and for your sympathetic reading of my book. It's a great book. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you for listening to the Scandalmongers podcast. This has been a podcast world production. You can get in contact with our show by emailing team at podcastworld.org, placing Scandalmongers in the heading, or via our social media links within the show's bio. 